And Moshe said, Hear, O Yisrael, Yahweh your Elohim, Yahweh is one. And you shall love Yahweh your Elohim with all your heart, with all your being, and with all your might. And these words which I'm commanding you today shall be in your heart, and you shall impress them upon your children, and shall speak of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way. When you lie down and when you rise up, and uh, shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontless between your eyes, and you shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Shabbat shalom, everyone. Shabbat shalom to everyone worshiping with us at home. Uh, the name of the message today is called Added Because of Transgression. And I uh, thought this would be a good message today. See, tomorrow is Shavuot, uh, which is commonly referred to as the Feast of what? Weeks. Uh, and, uh, and there's some people that wonder, you know, what's it all about and, and, and why do we observe it? Uh, I got a message on, uh, on YouTube called Shavuot. I'd encourage you to watch that one. Uh, it goes in a little further uh, detail as to some other aspects of it. But uh, the first reason that we, we keep Shavuot, we observe it, is because Yahweh said so, and I want to be like Yahshua. Oh, Amen. All right. But does it have any greater significance than uh, the, the, than just uh, bringing an offering of the first fruits of your wheat harvest. Because, you know, that's what this is. It's during the, 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 the wheat harvest. And, uh, you know, it makes me wonder, well, what if, what, if you're a, what if you're a sheep herder or a fisherman or a carpenter with no field of your own? And you have to rely on the grain of, of someone else's field, right? Can you just skip Shavuot because you're not a farmer? Nope. All right. Let's uh, let's see what Yahweh says. Deuteronomy 16. Devarim 16. And we're going to start reading in verse 16, and we're going to be on page 203 in the 98 ISR. Deuteronomy 16, 16. Three times in the year, how many of your males... All your males appear before Yahweh your Elohim in the place which he chooses at the festival of unleavened bread and at the festival of weeks and at the festival of booths and none should appear before Yahweh empty-handed but each one with the gift of his hand according to the blessing of Yahweh your Elohim which he has given you. So this is not just for farmers, I mean. All right. And uh, I happen to be in the camp that believes that Shavuot is when Yahweh gave the Torah to Yisrael and uh, then entered into a covenant with Yisrael at Mount Sinai. Now, the problem with that is there's not any real hard, fast evidence that says that as far as I know. However, <clears throat> there is plenty of evidence in the Scripture to indicate that it's quite likely the case. If you count 50 days... Uh, from Passover week, which is the second half of the first month, the month of Abib, you find yourself finishing up in the first half of the third month, which is where we are now. All right? So what's so special about that, you might ask? Well, let's turn to Exodus chapter 19. Shemot 19. We're going to start reading in verse 1. Uh, page 76. <clears throat> All right, Exodus 19, verse 1. In the, what, third month after the children of Israel had come out of the land of Mitzrayim, Egypt, on this day they came to the wilderness of Sinai. What month did they come out? The first month. All right. And what month are we in? We're in the third month now. All right, verse 2. For they set out from Rephidim uh, and had come to the wilderness of Sinai and camped in the wilderness. So Yisrael camped there before the mountain. And Moshe went up to Elohim. And Yahweh called to him from the mountain saying, this is what you are to say to the house of Yaakov and declare to the children of Israel. You have seen what I did to the Mitzrites and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. And now, if you diligently obey my voice 
and shall guard my covenant, then you shall be a treasured possession above all the peoples, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a reign of priests and a set-apart nation. Those are the words that you are to speak to the children of Israel. And Moshe came and called for the elders of the people and set before them all these words which Yahweh commanded him. And all the people answered together and said, All that Yahweh has spoken, we what shall do. So Moshe brought back the words of the people to Yahweh. Now isn't that interesting? In the third month, Yahweh makes a covenant with Israel, and basically Yahweh takes an oath telling them what he will do, and they agreed to it and said, All that Yahweh has said, we shall do. And this all happens in the third month. Now, the word translated week, as in feast of weeks, <coughs> is, uh, what we call Shavuot, uh, is Shavuot. All right? Now, uh, Shavuot is also pronounced Shavuot, just depending on which dialect you speak in it, which, which pronunciation you approve. Um, Strong's says, properly passive participle of H5650 uh, as the denominative of 7651, literally sevened. Okay, sevened. That is a week. All right, well, what does 7650 mean? If I can get my notes straightened out here. To swear, Shabbat, Shabbat, to swear, um, a juror, to take an oath, okay? Did you know that Bathsheba means daughter of an oath? That's, that's what Bathsheba means, daughter of an oath. Uh, Strong says concerning Shabbat, primitive root properly to complete, but used only as a denominative of 7651 to seven one's self, all right? That is to swear as if by repeating a declaration seven times. All right, now, so we find ourselves at Mount Sinai in the third month. Yahweh is making a covenant with Israel, and they say all that Yahweh has said we shall do, all right? And we all know what happened next, all right? But the eternal thing that Moshe brings back is the Torah of Yahweh, all right? And Yahweh wants us to count seven weeks or seven ourselves. All right? Every year, beginning at the time when Israel came out of Mitzrayim till we get to this time. Is that a coincidence? I don't think so. But there's, there's one more thing. Just prior to this, the children of Israel are grumbling against Yahweh and against Moshe. Are we surprised? <laughs> All right. <clears throat> During this period, Yahweh brought the manna to teach them about how to count and rest for the Sabbath. All right. How many days are there in each week? Seven. Shabbat. And which one is the Shabbat? The seventh. Okay. Perhaps he had a reason for teaching them about the sevens during this journey. <clears throat> but here's something else I think that's important, and, and, uh, uh, and it's this. After all the marvelous things that Yahweh had done, look how the children of Israel acted. All right, look at Exodus 16, verse 1. Exodus 16, verse 1, Shemot 1, 16, 1. And they set out from Elim, and all the congregation of the children of Israel came to the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elim and Sinai, on the 15th day of the second month, after their going out of the land of Mitzrayim. And all the congregation of the children of Israel, look at what it says here, grumbled, grumbled against Moshe and Aharon in the wilderness, and the children of Israel said to them, If only we had died by the hand of Yahweh in, uh, in the land of Mitzrayim, when we sat by the pots of meat. 
And when we ate, look at this, bread to satisfaction. See that? Bread to satisfaction. For you have brought us out into the, this wilderness to put this assembly to death with hunger. All right, now, look at Deuteronomy 16, and remember what they said. We ate bread to satisfaction. Deuteronomy 16 We're going to start reading in verse 9. Deuteronomy 16, verse 9. <clears throat> Count seven weeks for yourself. There's that seven. Begin to count seven weeks from the time you begin to put the what? Sickle to the grain. Isn't that what you make bread with? Huh. All right. And you shall perform the festival of weeks to Yahweh your Elohim according to the voluntary offering from your hand, which you give as Yahweh your Elohim blesses you. And you shall what? Rejoice before Yahweh. Not be grumbling. Not be grumbling. You shall rejoice before Yahweh your Elohim, you and your son and your daughter, uh, and your male servant and your female servant, and the Lewit, which is within your gates, and the stranger and the fatherless and the widow who are in your midst and, the pl and at the place where Yahweh your Elohim chooses to make his name dwell. And you shall remember that you were a slave in Mitzrayim and do, and, and, sh and, and you shall guard and do these laws. See, Yahweh doesn't want us to have that kind of messed up thinking. All right? When you, when you start longing for the the pots of meat and romance and what it was like. You need to remember that you were a slave in Mitzrayim, right? Now, all of us, we never were actually in physical Mitzrayim, but we were in a, we were in a spiritual Mitzrayim. And we don't need to get in that kind of thinking where we're thinking about, oh, what it was like. But we're supposed to remember that we were a slave in Mitzrayim. And that, I believe, is why when we celebrate Shavuot at, at, at the time that, of the giving of, of Yahweh's covenant Torah, that he doesn't want to hear any grumblings. All right? He commands us to rejoice and remember that we were slaves and that he brought us out. All right? Our message today is about the righteousness of Yahweh's Torah and the never-ending battle to defend it. We talked about battle last week a little bit, I think. Psalm 119. We're going to read one verse in, in, in Psalm 119. And uh, it's going to kind of be... We're going to be on 717 in the, in the uh, 98 ISR. That helps you get where we're going because 119 uh, got a lot of verses in it. Got 176. All right, Psalm 119, verse 160. Okay, 160. Here we go. Is everybody there? The what? Sum, S-U-M, the sum of your word is truth, and what's that next word? All your righteous right rulings are forever. All right? Well, what does the word sum mean? Sum means a total from adding, right? All right? Are the Psalms the Torah? No, the Psalms are not the Torah. Can we gain clarity of understanding about the Torah from reading the Psalms. Yes, we can. All right. See, the psalmist is expounding here on that which he understands about Yahweh and his righteous right rulings. All right. Now, from whom do you suppose you can get a better understanding about that? From the words of those like the psalmist here who, who uh, is desiring the righteousness, who were living under Yahweh's system, or by your average 19th, 20th, 21st century 
theologian who thinks the scripture consists of the Catholic canon of the New Testament and, and considers the rest of it uh, interesting history and helpful footnotes with which he can make his sermons more colorful. Which one do you think? Certainly we can get a better understanding from the words of those desiring righteousness who were living under Yahweh's system. Amen? All right. And the 119th Psalm, which is, like I said a while ago, 176 verses long, there's only two verses out, out of the whole, the whole thing that, that do not say something that's directly related to the righteousness of and the keeping of Yahweh's Torah. All right? Now, yeah. How does y'all, what Chris was mentioning this during Torah study today. How does the word of Yahweh define righteousness? Deuteronomy 6. Deuteronomy 6. Verse 24. And Yahweh commanded us to do all these laws to fear Yahweh our Elohim for our good always, to keep us alive as it is today. And it is, here it is, and it is righteousness for us when we guard to do all this command before Yahweh our Elohim as he commanded us. Is that too hard to understand? So if we, if we guard to keep some of it, is that righteousness? If we, if we guard to keep most of it, is that righteousness? If we guard to keep all, is that okay? It's not too hard to understand a check. <laughs> okay. Moshe says that it's righteousness for us when we guard to do all that Yahweh, uh, all this command before Yahweh or Elohim as he commanded. And Psalm 119 60 says, and all your righteous right rulings are forever. Most of our New Testament theologians these days do the exact opposite of what Yahshua instructed us. All right? And, and I want to spend just a moment here because we, we have new people joining us on our, our outreach video ministry program all the time that may not be aware of this. Look at Matthew 5. What we're about to read, I'm always amazed at... At, at the people that, that don't want to just take what Yahshua says here and just, and, and it's, it's real easy. It's just like what we read in Psalm 119, 160. It's just real, real easy. And so why we've got to work so hard to make it not say what it says is just, is just amazing. Matthew 5, 17. This is Yahshua speaking. Do not think that I came to destroy the Torah or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to complete, for truly, I say to you, till the heaven and the earth pass away, one jot or one tittle shall by no means pass from the Torah till all be done. And whoever then breaks one of the least of these commands, and teaches men so, shall be called least in the reign of the heavens. But whoever does and teaches them, he shall be called great in the reign of the heavens. All right, now, I've gone a long way around to get to this point. All right. There are many who will either try and explain away or ignore these words of Yahshua altogether. And they'll frequently use some of Paul's words to suggest that the Torah has been abolished or done away with. All right? And, and most of us have heard this all our lives. I mean, But if Yahshua said till heaven and earth would pass away, one jot or tittle would by no means pass from the Torah. And that whoever broke and taught others to break, even the least of these commands would be called least in the reign of the heavens. If Paul taught that the Torah had been a done way with, even the least amount, he'd be least in the reign of the heavens, wouldn't he? So, yeah, according to Yahshua's words. So, you're going to have to figure out who your Messiah is. Yahshua's mine. You know, this Seth said Yahshua is his, and and you know, and Ariel said Yahshua is hers. Um, 
You know, and, and, and I heard this gentleman one time say, Paul didn't come to straighten Yahshua out. You know? I seem to remember it was, was Yahshua that, that struck Paul blind, not the other way around. So, but what about Paul? Right, and see, I, I don't think that Paul <coughs> went through all the beatings and the stonings and the imprisonments and uh, being left for dead just because he liked the pay. You know, and, 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 uh, uh, and he liked to travel, and the job had lots of, you know, fringe benefits and, 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 and uh, a, a retirement package and all that, you know, right? I believe that Paul was a Torah-observant man who was convicted, all right, and that he taught a belief based on Torah observance. But there are those who twist Paul's words to... Lawlessness, just like Peter said that they would do. All right, Second Peter chapter two. Second Peter chapter two. It's gonna be on page eleven eighty-three, <clears throat> verse fourteen. So then, beloved ones, looking forward to this, do your utmost to be found by him in peace, spotless and blameless, and reckon the patience of our master as deliverance, as also our beloved brother Shaul, that would be Paul, wrote to you according to the wisdom given to him, as also in all his letters, speaking in them concerning these matters in which some are hard to understand, which those who are untaught and unstable twist to their own what? destruction, as they do also the other scriptures. You then, beloved ones, now watch this, being forewarned, watch lest you also fall from your own steadfastness. Now I want you to remember this word that Peter uses, steadfastness, okay? And pay close attention to this next part. Being, what are those next two words? Led away with the, what? Delusion of the lawless. Right? But grow in the favor and knowledge of our Master and Savior, Yahshua Messiah, to Him be the esteem both now and to the day that abides. Amen. Right? So Peter counts Paul as a beloved brother. Right? But even back then, there were those who were unlearned and unstable that twist Paul's words. And to what point do they twist them? It says to their own destruction, just like they do the other scriptures. And what does Peter charge and warn his beloved ones concerning these men? He says, watch. In other words, be on the lookout for this. And remain, that word, steadfast, or else you run the risk of being led away by men who teach you that you should keep the law. No. By those who have a delusion that they have not the law. The delusion of the lawless. Now, the word delusion means false, uh, a false belief or opinion. That's not a stretch, is it? Okay? All right. Let, let's read this again. Verse 13, 17. 2 Peter 3, 17. You then, beloved ones, being forewarned, watch lest you also fall away from your own steadfastness, being led away with the false belief or opinion of the lawless. Okay, you see that? We're just putting the definition in there instead of the word. The false belief or opinion. You see what Peter's saying? There were men then who were even twisting Paul's words and leading people away with a false belief concerning the law, saying that Paul was teaching lawlessness. Now, if that was, if it's what Paul was teaching then they've discredited him as being leased in the reign of the heavens. It's just the way it is. They don't, you know, that's just the way it is. Now, do you know what Torah means? It means instruction, right? It's translated oftentimes, it means law, but more specifically it means instruction. Many of us have grown up having been taught that the law was done away with and hearing the words of Paul being quoted, just like Peter said, by, by, by the way, 
uh, uh, saying things like, we're not under the law, we're under grace. Mm -hmm. All right? And as the IRS has it, uh, I mean the ISR, <laughs> the IRS will get it. The IRS will get it. All right? uh, the ISR, I, yeah, I might not go out and edit that one. And as the I as you know, I've never done that. I've never done that. We filed for an extension. I think it's getting close. And as the ISR has it in Romans six fourteen, you don't have to turn now. I'll just read it to you. For sin shall not rule over you, for you are not under the law, but under favor. Now this word favor here means goodwill. Right? It means goodwill. All right then. Think about this. Who wants to be instructed by Yahweh? Okay, I do. All right, let's read the same verse using the other word. For sin shall not rule over you, for you are not under the instruction of Yahweh, but under His good will. Do you actually think that Paul's really saying that we're not under the instruction of Yahweh? Do you think Paul is saying that we're not under the instruction of Yahweh? Because if we're not under the instruction of Yahweh, then from whom do we get our instruction? That's a good question right there, Stan. But this is exactly the kind of thing that Peter was warning us about. All right? Now, I want to share something with you that Yahweh's put on my heart. And, and turn with me to Galatians chapter 3. Um, Galatians chapter 3. Not gonna, we're not going to get it. There's a lot of things that we've learned about Galatians that folks in the churches just really don't want to dig deep enough into it to learn about because it kind of it messes up their paradigm. All right? When, when you start getting into what this book is really talking about. All right? But verse 1, chapter 3, verse 1. O oh, senseless Galatians, who has put you under a spell not to obey the truth, before whose eyes Yahshua Messiah has clearly portrayed among you as impaled? This only I wish to learn from you. Did you receive the Spirit by works of Torah or by the hearing of belief? Are you so senseless? Having begun in the Spirit, do you now end in the flesh? Have you suffered so much in vain, if indeed in vain? Is he, then, who is supplying the Spirit to you and working miracles among you, doing it by works of Torah or by hearing of belief? Even so, Abraham did believe Elohim, and it was reckoned unto him as righteousness. Now keep your finger here in Galatians 3 and turn to uh, uh, Genesis 15. Bereshit 15. Keep that finger there. We're going to start... Reading in verse 5 on page 13 of the ISR. Genesis 15, 5. And he brought him outside, he Yahweh brought uh, Abraham, Abraham, outside and said, Look now toward the heavens. And count the stars, if you are able to count them. And he said to him, so are your seed. And Abraham says, he believed, and Yahweh said, he reckoned it to him for righteousness. Just like Paul said, right? Just like Paul said. Okay, go back to Galatians 3. We're going to start reading in verse 7. Know then that those who are of belief are sons of Abraham and the scripture, having foreseen that Elohim would declare right the nations by belief, announced the good news to Abraham beforehand saying, all the nations shall be blessed in you. So that those who are of belief are blessed with Abraham the believer. For as many are of works of Torah are under the curse for it has been written, Curses everyone who does not continue in all that has been written in the book of the Torah to do them. And no one is declared right 
by Torah before Elohim is clear, for the righteous shall live by belief. And the Torah is not of belief, but the man who does them shall live by them. Messiah redeemed us from the curse of the Torah, having become a curse for us, for it has been written, Cursed is everyone who hangs upon a tree. In order that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the nations in Messiah Yahshua to receive the promise of the Spirit through belief. Brothers, as man, I say it, a covenant, even though it is man's, yet if it is confirmed, no one sets it aside or adds to it. But the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. He does not say, and to seeds, as of many, but as one, and to your seed, who is Messiah. Now, this I say, Torah that came 400 years, and 30 years later does not annul a covenant previously confirmed by Elohim and Messiah so as to do away with the promise. For if the inheritance is by the Torah, it is no longer by promise. But Elohim gave it to Abraham through a promise. Right. Paul is talking about the promise of the covenant here. All right? He's talking about the promise of the covenant. But let's take note of the rest of the story and what type of behavior the belief of Abraham produced. All right? Genesis, we're going to come back for another verse in Galatians, so keep your fan. Genesis 26, Bereshit 26. Um, going to start reading on page 25, verse 4. Bereshit 26, verse 4, and it says, And I shall increase your seed like the stars of the heavens. That's what he was talking about in the, in the promise, right? Now he's talking about in the promise. And I shall give all these lands to your seed, and in your seed all the nations there shall be blessed. Because Abraham obeyed my voice and guarded my charge, my commands, my laws, and my Torah. But the lawless ones never bring this part out. Okay? This is, this is what the belief manifested itself in. All right? Or how it manifested. All right? They prefer to be selective about their observations rather than the, remember what it said in, in, in Psalm 119, 160, the sum total of Yahweh's word. All right? There are a couple of passages here in Galatians that the lawless really like to turn to, right, which have, have given many Torah keepers a problem. Right, the first one is Galatians 3, back over here in verse 19. Why then the Torah? It was added because of transgressions until the seed should come to whom the promise was made. And it was ordained through messengers in the hand of a mediator. Right. The scripture skewers will then twist this so as to say that now that Yahshua has come, the Torah, which they fail to realize means instruction of Yahweh, has been done away with. All right? But without understanding, they twist this. All right, so the question is, what is sin? What is sin? It's transgression of the law. It, it tells us in 1 in first John 3, 4, everyone doing sin also does lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness, or as the KJB puts it, whoever committed sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is transgression of the law. All right? If sin is transgression of the law, then, then how does Paul's statement make sense? It was added because people were breaking it. See, that statement doesn't make sense, does it? You know, that's sort of like saying, since people kept breaking the traffic laws, the state decided that we needed pass, to pass some traffic laws because they were breaking traffic laws that we don't have anyway. Right? right. But you see, Paul's words actually do make sense because the Torah's always been there. It's always been there. 
I know folks that think it wasn't, but it has always been. Here's an example. Turn, funny how we keep turning back to Genesis. Genesis chapter 4. And I know that there are some of you who, who are wrestling with family situations where, where, where they're, they're still dealing with, they're putting you down because you're reading what it says and, and reading what it clearly says, and they're trying to look at it through that, that, you know those mirrors you go look at at the carnival where it distorts what you really look like? That's what they're, that's what they're, they're looking through. That's what they're looking through. Genesis 4, verse 6. And Yahweh said to Cain. Now, you remember Genesis 4 is a long, 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 long time before Sinai, right? Okay. Just want to make sure everybody realized that. Now, the mountain was already there, don't you? <laughs> All right. Genesis 4, 6. And Yahweh said to Cain, Why are you wroth? And why is your face fallen? If you do well... Is there not acceptance? By the way, this also shows that, 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 that favor was there before Yahshua, too. Okay? Yeah, that word people say grace. Yeah. Right. If you do well, is there not acceptance? And if you do not do well, what's crouching at the door? Sin. What's Sin. Transgression of the law. Okay. And its desire is for you, but you should master it. All right? And as we read above, because Abraham obeyed my voice and guarded my charge, my commands, my laws, and my Torah. All right? Yahweh had to write them down to take away the excuses. All right? See, like most houses, you've got unwritten rules at the house, especially if you've got kids. Even if you haven't got kids, you still got unwritten rules. But, but uh, uh, like, you know, you might have rule, don't track mud in the house, all right? Don't track mud in the house. You'd think we, all, you'd think we would remember to do that, right? Don't track mud in the house, all right? <clears throat> don't touch the scepter. That's right. See, at our house, we call the remote control the scepter. And the king is the only person that's supposed to have the scepter. <laughs> now, back when the prince still lived at the house, if the king wasn't there, it was okay for the prince to use it. All right. All right. Don't touch the scepter. Don't, don't leave the doors open. Are we, are we trying to air condition the whole neighborhood? All right. All right. Put the top on the bottles. Don't leave the refrigerator door open. Unwritten rules. No, we're not going to talk about that one. I'll tell you this. I'll tell you, I'll, I'll, I will take one little sidetrack there. Okay, so Pat was saying put the toilet seat down. Okay. And I was listening to this, this radio program one time where they were talking about gnat bites on there. And, and, this, and this one lady was just really complaining about how her, her, her sons and her husband wouldn't put the toilet seat down. And this other lady called in later and she said, I wish I had that lady's problem. Mine won't remember to lift it up. <laughs> See, you might take that home and share that, Pat. <laughs> All right. Do you ever hear these words? Well, I forgot. Yeah. <laughs> now, look, I, I am going to give the kids a little bit of a break here. I'm going to give the kids a little bit of a break. Because parents, have you ever in your past said, oh, I forgot. When I was a kid, yeah. All right. Sometimes parents will put the rules on the refrigerator. All right? They'll write them down, and they'll put the rules on the refrigerator. And why do we do that? We do that to take away the excuse of, well, I forgot. Okay? All right? Yahweh even gave us, beyond writing them down, Yahweh gave us a reminder to wear on our clothes to take away 
the excuse of, well, I forgot. Because you know why? Because we'll do that. I forgot. All right. Rule number one about kings. The king is the king. That's rule number one with kings, all right? Exodus 23 says, you have no other mighty ones against my face. All right? That's rule number one. The king's the king. All right? Yahweh had to write it down and give it to us because we were transgressing what should have been understood already. All right? And that's why Aharon made a golden calf and called it what? Yahweh. All right. An another one that they like. Um, I'll just read this one. Uh, you can turn it if you want to. Galatians 3.11. And that no one is declared right by Torah before Elohim is clear, for the righteous shall live by belief. All right? Now, uh, it similarly says in Romans 1.17, for in it the righteousness of Elohim is revealed from belief to belief as it has been written, but the righteous shall live by belief. And possibly in Hebrews 10.38, but the righteous, if Paul wrote Hebrews, but the righteous shall live by belief. But if anyone draws back, my being has no pleasure in him. But keeping in mind, this is the same Paul that wrote in Romans 2.13, for the hearers of the Torah, I'm sorry, for not the hearers of the Torah, thank you, for not the hearers of the Torah are righteous in the sight of Elohim, but the doers of the Torah shall be declared right. All right? And Romans 2.25, the same Paul says, for circumcision indeed profits if you practice the Torah, but if you're, trans, if you're a transgressor of the Torah, your circumcision has become uncircumcision. All right? Now, what I want to look at today is what is Paul quoting when he says, the righteous shall live by belief, or as it says in the KJV, but no man is justified by the law in the sight of Elohim. It is evident for the just shall live by faith. All right, now, Paul is quoting here from Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 4. Now, go, um, go ahead and turn to Habakkuk because um, we're going to read the whole book today. Yeah, we are. No, not Genesis to Revelation. The whole book of Habakkuk. It's a... It's a whopping three chapters. Page uh, 626. All right, but now... Paul is quoting Habakkuk 2.4. As we, as we read through this book, I want you to take a notice of what the real theme of this book is. All right. Now, the scriptures use a different word, but let's take a look and note what Habakkuk's first complaint to Yahweh is. All right. Habakkuk 1.1. 1, 1. The message which the prophet Habakkuk saw... O oh, Yahweh, till when shall I cry and you not hear? I cry to you, violence, and you do not save. Why do you show me wickedness and cause me to see perversity? For ruin and violence are before me, and there is strife and contention. And watch this. Therefore the Torah ceases. Remember Paul's quoting this book. Therefore the Torah ceases, and right ruling never goes forth. For the wrong him in the righteous, so that right ruling comes out, what's that next word? Twisted. This is Habakkuk's first complaint, violence to the Torah. And I think it's interesting that Peter talked about people twisting the word 
to their own destruction. All right. Now, does any of this go on today? Well, yeah. People twist about, uh, like the Sabbath. They, 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 they twist about why we don't have to keep the Sabbath. They twist about why we don't have to eat clean. We, they twist why we celebrate pagan days and not keep the set-apart days of Yahweh, even though Yahweh said His Sabbaths are, are a sign between Him and His people forever. All right? And, 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 uh, and, it, and it just goes on and on. And then Yahweh describes something very terrible. Let's keep reading. Verse 5. Among the nations, uh, look, and among the nations and see, and be amazed, be amazed, for a work is being wrought in your days which you would not believe without if it were told. See, I'm raising up the Chaldeans. Now, the Chaldeans are the bad guys. Nobody likes the Chaldeans. Boo on the Chaldeans, okay? See, I'm raising up the Chaldeans, a bitter and hasty nation who is going through the breadth of the earth to possess dwelling places that are not theirs. They are frightening and fearsome. Their right ruling and their exaltation proceed from themselves. That sounds like everybody's doing what's right in his own eyes, sort of, doesn't it? Right? Their horses shall be swifter than leopards and more fierce than evening wolves. And their horsemen shall charge ahead, and their horsemen come from afar. They fly as eagles rushing to eat. All of them come for violence. The direction of their face is like the east wind, and they gather captives like sand. That's, that's, that's pretty scary, isn't it? And they scoff at sovereigns and princes, uh, and princes are a laughing matter to them. They laugh at every stronghold, for they pile up earth and seize it. Then shall he pass on as a wind and transgress and be guilty and ascribe this power to his mighty one. See, and Habakkuk can't believe what he's hearing. Yahweh's going to let this happen to Yehuda? Verse 12. Are you not from everlasting, O Yahweh, my Elohim, my set-apart one? You do not die, O Yahweh. You have appointed them for right ruling, O rock. You, are you have established them for reproof. You, whose eyes are too clean to see evil, you are not able to look on wrong. Why do you look on those who act treacherously? Keep silent when the wrong devours one more righteous than he. And would you make men like fish of the sea, like creeping creatures that have no ruler over them? The wicked foe has pulled all of them up with a hook, caught them in his nets, and gathers them in his dragnet. Therefore he rejoices and exults. Therefore he offers to his net and burns incense to his dragnet. For by them is his portion fat and his food is rich. Is he therefore to keep on emptying his net and slaying nations without sparing. I, all right, 2 verse 1. I stand at my watch and station myself on the watchtower and wait and see what he says to me and what to answer when I'm reproved. And Yahweh answered me and said, Write the vision and inscribe it on tablets so that he who reads it runs. For the vision is yet for an appointed time and it speaks of the end and it does not lie. If it lingers, wait for it, for it shall certainly come. It shall not delay. And here we go. See he who, but, uh, see, I'm sorry. See he whose being is not, what's that next word? Upright. In him is puffed up. But the righteous one lives by his steadfastness. This is what Paul is quoting in Galatians. Do you remember the word that Peter said that we should hold on to? Our steadfastness. Not being led away by the delusion of the lawless. Right? Is what we just read not talking about a terrible, awful, coming destruction against the people of Yehuda because of the violence that they are doing to what? The Torah. That's what it said. To the Torah. Right? And he says that the righteous will live by his steadfastness. 
His steadfastness to what? The Torah. In the face of all that. Right? And this is what Paul is quoting, and this is what they're twisting to their own destruction. Because they don't take time to go back and see what's going on. And they twist Paul's words to their own violence to it too. All right? In the KJV, as I said, it says, Behold, the, sto- the soul which is lifted up is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. All right? The word translated faith is Strong's number 530. I'm not going to get into deep definitions today. Uh, emunah is the word. Uh, it literally means firmness, figuratively security, moral fidelity. And the BDB says firmness, fidelity, steadfastness, steadiness. All right? See, Emunah means to say true and stand firm. All right. So, what do we suppose Yahweh is wanting the inhabitants of Judah to stay true to? Well, is he not answering Habakkuk concerning what he is going to do about all the Torah breaking? All right. Verse 5. And also, because wine betrays him, a man is proud, and he does not stay at home. Because he enlarges his appetites as the grave, and he is like death, and is not satisfied, and gathers to himself all nations, and heaps up for himself all peoples. Shall not all of these lift up a proverb against him, and a mocking riddle against him, and say, Woe to him who increases uh, what is not his. Till when is he to load himself, load on himself many pledges? Do not your creditors rise up suddenly and those who make you tremble wake up and you be plundered for them? Because you have plundered many nations. All the remnant of the people shall plunder you because of men's blood and doing violence to the land, to the city, and to all who dwell in it. Woe to him who is getting evil gain for his house in order to set his nest on high to escape the clutches of evil. And you have counseled shame for your house to cut off many peoples and your being is sinning. For a stone from the wall cries out and a beam from the timbers answers. Woe to him who builds a town by blood and establishes a city by unrighteousness. See, it is not from Yahweh of hosts that peoples labor only for fire and nations weary themselves for naught. For the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the esteem of Yahweh as the waters cover the sea. Woe to him who gives drink to his neighbor, pouring out your wineskin and also making him drunk in order to look on their nakedness. You shall be filled with shame instead of esteem. Drink you too and be exposed as uncircumcised. The cup of the right hand of Yahweh shall come around to you and great shame upon your esteem. For the violence done to Lebanon is to overwhelm you and the ravaging of beasts by which You made them afraid because of men's blood and the violence to the land, to the city, and to all that dwell in it. Of what use shall a carved image be? For its makers has carved it, a molded image and a teacher of falsehood. For the maker trusts what he has made to make dumb idols. Woe to him who says to wood, Awake, to silent stone, arise. Is it a teacher? See, It is overlaid with gold and silver, and there's no spirit in it at all uh, all inside it. But Yahweh is set apart, is in his set apart, Hekal, let all the earth be silent before him. And in chapter 3, verse 1, a prayer of Habakkuk, the prophet of Shigionoth. O Yahweh, I have heard your report. I was afraid. O Yahweh, renew your work in the midst of the years. Make it known in the midst of the years. In wrath, remember compassion. Eloah comes from Teman. And the set-apart one from Mount Paran, Selah. His splendor shall cover the heavens, and his praise shall fill the earth. And the brightness is as the light. He has the rays from his hand, and there his power is hidden. Before him goes pestilence. And burning flame goes, uh, goes forth at his feet. And he shall stand and measure the earth. He shall look and shake the nations. And the ancient mountains are shattered. 
The age-old hills shall bow. His ways are everlasting. I saw the tents of Kushan under sorrow. The curtains of the land of Midian tremble. Shall Yahweh burn against the rivers? Is your displeasure against the rivers? Is your wrath against the sea? What you ride on your horses, your chariots of deliverance? You uncover your bow. The oaths of the rod of the word, Selah. You cut through the earth with rivers. The mountains shall see you. They tremble. The storm of water shall pass over. The deep shall give forth its, vi I'm sorry, its voice. Um, it shall lift up its hands. Sun, moon shall stand still in their places. Like light, your arrows fly. Like lightning is your glittering spear. You're, uh, you step through the earth in rage. You thresh the Gentiles in wrath. You shall go forth to save your people, to save your anointed. You shall smite the head from the house of the wrong by laying bare from the foundation the neck, Selah. You shall pierce with his own arrows the head of his leaders. They stormed along to scatter me, rejoicing as if to devour the poor in secret. You shall tread the sea with your horses, the foaming of many waters. I heard and my body trembled. My lips quivered at the sound. Rottenness came into my bones and I trembled within myself that I might rest for the day of distress to come upon the people who would attack us. Though the fig tree does not blossom and there is no fruit on the vine, the yield of the olive has failed and the fields brought forth no food. The flock has been cut off from the fold and there is no herd in the stalls. Yet I exult in Yahweh, I rejoice in the Elohim of my deliverance to the chief stringer with, many, with my stringed instruments. All right, now, after reading this, a book whose entire message is about Yahweh meeting, right, uh, uh, meeting out righteous judgment on Judah by a heathen nation because of the very reason that they were not keeping the Torah and they were twisting right ruling, do we really think that Paul is quoting a passage from this very book, a book about remaining steadfast in the adherence of the Torah in order to do away with the Torah. Absolutely not. Kind of sounds a little bit crazy when you think about it. Kind of like somebody's deluded, twisted, <laughs> yeah. Sounds twisted. All right. So, as we prepare to observe Shavuot, Let's, let's remember a couple of things. Let's turn back to Deuteronomy 16. Devarim 16. Because I believe this really is the time when Yahweh wrote it down and gave it to us. All right. Deuteronomy 16.10 And you shall perform the festival of weeks to Yahweh your Elohim according to the voluntary offering from your hand which you give as Yahweh your Elohim blesses you. And you shall rejoice before Yahweh your Elohim you and your son and your daughter and your male servants and your female servants and the lay wheat which is within your gates and the stranger and the fatherless and the widow who are in your midst at the place where Yahweh your Elohim chooses to make his name dwell and you shall remember that you were a slave in Mitzrayim, and you shall guard and do these laws. I wonder if that's connected. All right. And our last passage today is the one that we read before, Psalm 119, 160. The sum of your word is truth, and all your righteous right rulings are forever. Yahweh bless you and guard you. Yahweh make his face to shine upon you and show favor to you. Yahweh lift up his face upon you and give you his complete contentment.